In the early hours of June 16, 1959, the lifeless body of actor George Reeves, who played the original Superman, was found dead in his bedroom from an apparent gunshot wound to his head. Although the LAPD have ruled his death a suicide, controversy still continues to surround his mysterious death. Many of George Reeves' friends and colleagues do not believe that he committed suicide. However, no credible evidence has ever been produced to support this contention. My guest this afternoon will answer many questions and theories that still linger to this day. All right, my guest this afternoon has explored the life and death of the original Superman, actor George Reeves, since the 1970s. He has also spoken about George Reeves on the E! Channel, A&E, and on the DVDs of seasons 2 through 6, The Adventures of Superman. His book, Speeding Bullet, The Life and Bizarre Death of George Reeves, is considered by many to be the factual and quintessential book on the death of George Reeves. He has also authored Behind the Crimson Cape, Encrypt 39, Coroner's Case 45426, George Reeves. All these books can be found online as well. He also has a fantastic website at janallenhenderson.com. That's janallen, A-L-A-N, henderson.com, which is phenomenal, folks. Please visit it. We are definitely, we're going to delve deep into what happened to actor George Reeves on that fateful night when he lost his life. My guest is Jan Allen Henderson. Jan, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and hello to everybody in Boston this afternoon. Uh, why don't we start off, Jan? Um, let's talk a little bit about, about your story. Well, it was kind of interesting because I sort of grew up around all of this, um, having been born in Hollywood. Um, my aunt... Uh, was basically a, a friend of a lot of people's out here and uh, suggested my mother come out uh, to California to live, bringing me along. And a mutual friend of theirs, Cecil Elliott, was one of the guest players on the first season Adventures of Superman show called The Evil Three. She was the lady in the wheelchair, Elsa. Uh, another uh, factor was a neighbor of mine, was Lee Sholem, who was the director of a lot of the first season shows and the feature Superman and the Mole Men. So I kind of got dropped into it unbeknowingly. <laughs> but I, I remember the first time I had seen the episode The Evil Three was at Cecil's house. And she was sitting in her uh, easy chair watching this episode. And when she'd come on, in her wheelchair on TV, she had exactly the same laugh that she had on TV, which as a kid scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so uh, let's get into George Reeves if we can, Jan. Um, he started his career in showbiz like a lot of like many actors, uh, playing doing theater at the famous Pasadena Playhouse, and he quickly went into film. Right. Um, well, what happened was is he was uh, under contract to Warner Brothers, and had done his first short ride, Cowboy Ride. And they loaned him out to Selznick for Gone with the Wind. Uh, his uh, talented twin brother was played by Fred Crane, who became a great friend of mine in the 80s and 90s. So George was making his way through the movie business, doing a lot of things, little bit parts at Warner Brothers, featured roles, you know, anything the studio wanted him to do. Right. And what happened was he was doing really well, and he was doing... 1943 saw him doing Hopalong Cassidy pictures. And from that, he moved into what I think is probably the greatest motion picture he was ever in, which was called So Proudly We Hail, where he plays the lover of Claudette Colbert in a wartime situation. So after he joined, I believe, the Air Force, and he was in Special Forces, but it, these Special Forces were to put on plays and things to entertain the troops. Um, he was working as an actor uh, in the service, but the problem was, like a lot of these guys that went to war, when they came back, the roles had dried up for them and they were slim pickings. And George tried to fight his way through that, did pretty well, did some B pictures, but, you know, the bottom line is, then came Superman. 
Right, right. And how did he get? I mean, he was a big, obviously a big, dashing gentleman, a very handsome gentleman. I mean, he, I mean, he was literally out of central casting. Of, I mean, Superman. He was per, he was born for the role, without doubt. In fact, his resemblance is probably what sold him on this. Right, right, you know, with yeah. with with the jaw, the hairline, the whole thing. They didn't, you know, like with Kirk Allen in the serials, they had to put a spit curl over his forehead, and you know, now with Kirk, he wasn't wearing the pads that George had to wear because George had sloping shoulders. So you know, it 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 was they wanted to go from the cartoon thing of the serials into more of a serious format which is the reason they got Robert Maxwell, who was the producer of the radio shows, along with his wife, Jessica. So from about 1940, starring Bud Collier, uh, Robert and Jessica Maxwell produced uh, the Superman TV, uh, Superman TV show, excuse me, Superman <laughs> radio show. So anyway, what, what happened then was uh, they had done the 1948 serial with Kirk Allen over at Columbia, they did a, a 1950 Adam Man versus Superman serial at Columbia, but the people at Superman Inc. wanted to throw a different spin on it and make it for all the family, including adults, hence the first season of Superman. And folks, you need to remember, this is like 1952 when Superman came out. There is no social media. There are no computers. This is it. For, for a kid who's 8, 9, 10 years old, this is their hero. Oh, without a doubt. You know, the kids have been stoked on this for 10 years right. in the comics and in the, and going to the serials. I might add, the first serial in certain venues was shown in sepia tone, wow. which was a big thing back then. Wow. So, um, so he, he, he actually did some, he did I Love Lucy, he did, um, he was actually in- That from, was later on. Right, he actually did From Here to Eternity as well, but I think he was, Yes, indeed. Right. Now, there's all kinds of stuff going back and forth- with the fans and such, that a lot of his part was cut out of From Here to Eternity. The shooting script says, contraire, that exactly what he was given in From Here to Eternity is what appears on the screen. But Jack Larson, who played Jimmy Olsen, went to the premiere, I believe at the Pantages Theater, at the behest of his friend Montgomery Clift. Mm. And he saw scenes that had been removed at that premiere when it was finally released. So you have di different schools of thought on that. Right, right. So, so let, let, let's get into George Reeves himself. I mean, he, he, he was the only child. His, he, was the, he was the pride and joy, obviously, of his mother. Um, and he, he was like a lot of those old actors back then. He loved the drink. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, his drinking has been reported in a lot of different places. And I think it really has to do with what time period one is talking about to even try to evaluate that. I don't think he was drinking as much as re has been reported on the night of his death, but that's just me. Um, so, so, and there are reasons why I believe that. All right, we'll get into that. How does he meet Tony Mannix and Lenore Lennon? Do you know? Well, I believe he met Tony Mannix in either 1948 or 1949 in New York. And basically, uh, he could have met her here. There's not really a lot of documentation on that. But as Noel Neal told me, and is quoted in Behind the Crimson Cape, Tony promised him roles that mm. he was not getting, better roles, which was not happening for him after World War II. So what happened was, I don't think that Tony ever got him a part in a picture. He had an agent named Gus Dembling, who was his representative till 1955 when Gus died. And with the whole Superman thing and the two-year turnaround contract or 18-month turnaround contract, he was pretty well spoken for in the representation department. So, I mean, I think, you know, these are all stories. It depends on who you ask. It's all hearsay. Right. And just a little brief background about Tony Mannix. She was married to uh, MGM's Eddie Mannix. Known, he was known as a fixer at MGM during the Golden Age. Well, it, you it, see, now we're getting into popular revisionist history. We don't know that. By the fixer 
keeping people out of trouble right. that were under contract to MGM. Yeah, that's absolutely right. he, true. He his was job, involved he, with the Paul Byrne thing. Right, his job was to make the pr- stars' problems pretty much disappear. Well, one of the stories I heard is his office was right next to the Telex office, and the Telex office would print out duplicates of every communique from the actors, producers, directors, whatever, they print out an extra one for him so he could keep an eye on their shenanigans, if there were any shenanigans. Right. Well, and there were. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, golden age of Hollywood was um, a lot of drinking, smoking, and a lot of, a lot of other stuff I can't say in the air. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> so let, let's Canoodling. Get, <laughs> so, so let's get into June 15, 1959. There, he was having dinner with, with Lenore Lennon. He was at Paul's Steakhouse at Doheny and Burton Way. Okay. Um, I know that area very well because I used to work in that area and go by that intersection. First of all, Paul's Steakhouse is long gone. But they were there. They went for dinner. The bottom line was, once they had finished dinner, George went to the piano bar, where a gentleman who I was lucky enough to speak with and become friends with in the last years of his life, Mr. Merrill Sparks, was the featured pianist at the piano bar. And he was doing his gig that night. He told me that George came to the piano bar while Lenore was associating and socializing with the other patrons in the bar, perhaps obtaining drinks from them. Hmm. But he told me that George was maybe slightly under the influence, hmm. but he was absolutely composed, completely in control of his faculties, and he sat there and, and uh, listened to a set by Merrill, and as Merrill told me, he could have reached out and touched him. That's how close he was. Wow. Now, afterwards... Merrill was taking a break between sets. So what happens is he's out there on the, on the sidewalk. There's a valet parking lot adjacent to this. George and Lenore are waiting for the car to be brought around. And Lenore is lighting into George about their intended nuptials, either as, as Merrill put it in Baja, California or elsewhere. Hmm. And they got in the car and left. But it was a heated situation from Lenore's standpoint. And Lenore was known in some circles as being, as they said back then, a tough broad. She was also known as being a cafe society woman. And what that means is she was one of the mascots at Tut Shores, which is generally an all-male establishment, sports figures, etc., you know, and, 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 you Jackie know, Gle- Jackie, Gle- Jackie Gleason sprawled yeah, out. Yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, it yeah. was a guy's bar, yes, and there yes. were a few ladies that were the mascots or the friendly hostesses that were uh, there for fun. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was Lenore's situation. It was called Cafe Society. In fact, Truman Capote based Honey Go Lightly from Breakfast at Tiffany's on Lenore Lemon. Oh, wow. Wow, did not know that one. Woo, very good. Well, that is not common knowledge, but honey, go lightly. Uh, here's an interesting fact for, for my audience to know that. So they were having a good time at, at Paul's Bar. Okay, now George Reeve drives home that night with a 2.7 alcohol level. He drove home. Well, now we hit another stumbling block. <laughs> How does someone right, right. who is over the legal limit by at least double drive approximately five or six miles up a long winding canyon road you have to ask yourself that question and apply common sense now did merrill say that he drove merrill being the bar uh, no well he didn't he did not tell me he saw he saw them get into the car Hmm. he said they were waiting for the car and my impression is he didn't want to be in the way or he didn't want them to know that they that he had heard there right. shall we say brouhaha so who said that he was driving the authorities the authorities said he was driving home the, well the, the, who else would drive lenore was notoriously nearsighted and basically wow. commented in an interview just before her death that she needed a cab to get to the bathroom which was, of course, a joke. 
but yeah. you know, she was nearsighted, so she wasn't going to be doing. It. Well, t- things would have ended up differently if she would have been doing the driving. That's a fact. Mm. Oh. But the blood alcohol has always been a point of content, uh, contention. Mm. Interesting. So they so they Just make it because of the way it was taken. H- how was it taken? Okay. The bottom line is is after George died. Now here is. The, the main point to remember that body was taken to the mortuary under law. It's supposed to be taken to the coroner's office. Steve Hodell points this out in the, his black Dahlia yes, Avenger books. That past guest on my show. I did a series show with him. Great guy. Yes, I know that three months ago and uh, all suicides are assigned a coroner's case and are subject to autopsy and complete forensic examination. That body wasn't taken to the coroner's office until seven days later, at least. Hmm. So they had a prepared and embalmed body. Now, getting back to the blood, which all dovetails into this, is the simple fact that I found a slip of paper within the police report coroner's report and it's all kind of mixed up depending on where you get this stuff because you have to buy it online and a lot of these people don't know where this stuff comes from and have no idea the chronology of where these pages should fit well it said 10 a.m. at the morning a representative from the coroner's office went to the mortuary to take a sample of the blood It also has handwritten down at the bottom of it, hold stomach and liver for tox screen. Now, what are you going to do with an embalmed body where you need those organs? How are you going to get anything out of that? Right, right, right. You know, the deal was sealed. You see, now, my friend Lou Cosa, who has the historical George Reeves archives books, which is three volumes concerning everyone that had anything to do with George Reeves, including acquaintances. In some of these clippings that he's collected over years and years that are in these three volumes, several names of investigators were mentioned. Where were these people? It was also noted that the deputy coroner released the body to the mortuary. Who of all people would know that that was improper? But the deputy coroner. Right, right. Okay, so how did, how did they get that one through? See, we have questions. Right, right. There's so many. Every time you answer a question right. with this, you get five or ten more. Oh. Wow, interesting. interesting. Which, which makes it very difficult. So let, let's get let's go try to go back to um, so George Reese supposedly is driving with a two point seven alcohol level up to Benedict Canyon. Um, what Law ha- enforcement people have told me that this is impossible. I know it, it, it's. I mean, this is this is on the verge of alcohol poisoning. Right, right. Your stomach got to get pumped. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. So how can somebody that's virtually comatose drive? So this is documented that the, the authorities said that Mister. Mr. Rees was driving the vehicle that night. Well, who else was there to drive it? <laughs> they didn't overstate it. They didn't understate it. They said they returned from the restaurant to the home. Yeah, because not a lot of How pe- else could they have gotten there? That's a very interesting point and an interesting fact that not a lot of people know this. You know, they want to be experts about it, but they don't know about this pot. Um, anyway, so, so they make it back to Benedict Canyon. Okay, and, uh, right. Are they home alone when they walk in? No, there were two people in the guest room over the garage, and that was Carol Van Ronkel and Robert Condon, who what? was the older brother of Richard Condon, who did the Manchurian Candidate. Wow. Hmm. Okay. And I believe that the argument carried over into the home, and I believe it got much more heated. And I think... Probably the person that was closest to 2-7 was Lenore. <laughs> and yeah. I believe... I, now, when I say I believe, that doesn't mean I know. That means I have a very strong suspicion. But I believe that in the heat of this argument, that Lenore Lemon basically took the gun out, 
popped a couple of rounds off in the floor and said, hey, listen, buddy, I leave you. You don't leave me. And somehow, whether it be, and, and I don't think any of this was premeditated for two seconds, that that gun went off and George Reeves was dead. Mm. Now, why couldn't they find any forensic evidence? Well, we've already discussed the uh, prepared body being re- remanded to the coroner. The bottom line is, is the wounds were sewn shut by the embalmer with twine. That's in the autopsy report. That's there for everybody to see. Right. In aside from the autopsy, I mean, the police, the police that show up are pretty much they're like they're like brothers of the Keystone cops. They're not very well equipped mentally either. Well, if you see, you can. A lot of people have said that, and I have found no evidence to to, to prove any of that. Those people did not call for at least sixty to eighty minutes. Right. In the house. Now, why? why? So, what happened in that sixty to eighty minutes is the question. Well, that that would tend myself and a lot of other people listening to believe that the people in the house were trying to get their story straight. Well, I think they were trying to get some other things straight. Right. Yeah. They put some throw. Okay. Now, Doctor Lovell on North Mission Road, when reviewing the case, he called it out and out suicide. But what was not left in the final broadcast was the fact that, you know, he said, now, if somebody rearranged this crime scene, then it's a whole different story. Right. But you see, there's no proof of that, and there's nobody around to tell you about that. In fact, we went looking for all of those officers. All we got was V.A. Peterson up an article about him being a former high school football player. Hmm. Okay. The others were gone. Nobody's heard of Johnson or Corby or any of the others mentioned in Lou Kosa's archives books. So we don't know. And you would also ask the question, why would the people in the house, you know, risk their reputations to cover up for Lenore? Well, first of all, Robert Condon was supposedly writing a profile on Archie Moore. George was supposedly going to do an exhibition wrestling match or a boxing match because he was a boxer, not a wrestler, with Archie Moore. There's no evidence that any of that ever took place. There's no evidence any preliminary uh, uh, PR was done to promote this event. It's just another one of these stories that has, right. has been going around since all of this activity. Right, there's so many stories out there, so many different theories. I um, mean, you know, he, 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 you know, obviously the, Superman was was canceled, and they said he was depressed, and maybe that's why he did. But his career was just well, about to take off. Okay, let me stop you right there. There's no indication Superman was canceled. In fact, right, right. there were stories that there was going to be a seventh season. That's what I'm saying. He, you know, there was, he was maybe doing a movie in Spain as well. Well, yes, that those things were talked about. Right. So why would but, you commit you know, suicide? The, the bottom line is, w- with any of this, um, he was, according to Noel Neal, and she told me this face to face. She went to the studio for a costume fitting and saw George and one of the other directors, because George was going to direct a goodly amount of right. the seventh season shows sitting around Whitney Ellsworth's office playing cards. So, according to her, there was going to be a seventh season. Whitney Ellsworth, all of his life, denied that, the producer of the show. Hmm. So where do you go with this? Right, right, right. Interesting. You see, there's some, every time you take a turn, there's something wrong. Oh. Every time you take a turn, there's more questions. You know, it can go on and on and on. The blood. Why, why weren't the, 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 the marks... The, the gun on the head, proving it's suicide. Well, that's because the body was altered, washed, and prepared for viewing. His hair was dyed black. He had snow white hair when he was alive on the 15th. And when he gets to the coroner's office, his hair's jet black. It had been dyed. He was prepared for the service. Hmm. In fact, his mother sent a telegram to the funeral home saying, whatever you do, do not cremate my son. Nothing can be done with my son until my arrival in California. Wow. And whose idea was cremation? My bet was Lenore Lemon. Right, right. My, that'd be my bet, But too. I can't prove it. Wow. 
So tell me if this is true, this theory or this story. On June 16, 1959, actress Phyllis Coates, everybody knows her, she played Lois Lane, was woken up at 4.30 by a very strange phone call. Uh, from Tony I, Mannix. Tony Mannix, right. She, she was, what do I think of that? Wh- I think that is absolutely possible. I also think the reason that Helen could have gotten, Helen Besselow, George's mother, could have gotten that telegraph off as early as she did because it was like 8 in the morning in Galesburg, okay, is because Tony called her the minute she heard about this. Now, Fred Crane, who I also was friends with, George's Tarleton twin brother, told me he was working at a radio station and it came over the teletype. That's where he found out. And that was about one in the morning. Hmm. Now, if you take that and you look at the official report, the call didn't come in till 120. There's 20 minutes there that's not accounted for. Hmm. And how could, you, how could it get on the news and the teletype that fast? Yeah, right. Wow. Okay. So you have more inconsistencies. You know, if there's any example of Murphy's Law, this is it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, it's, it's so, okay. many, so many theories. But, but see, what happened to the 60 to 80 minutes? What happened to that 20-minute discrepancy? Okay? The, these don't fit within the timeline. Right. Now, yeah. the thing of it is, as far back as the 30s, there were tests for gunpowder residue. Well, couldn't somebody have showered? Right in that time. Right, he was ne- he was never the body was never the police never looked for never looked for uh, residue on, on well, his there hands. Was nothing. By the time the coroner got it, there was nothing there to find because it had been altered by the embalmer in the preparation. So it's it, it, it's like handing you something completely worthless and saying that this is the acceptable theory. That doesn't make any sense. So his good friend Gene LaBelle shows up, okay? Yes, um, and Gene LaBelle is also a friend. Okay, now now what happened when he showed up? Because there was a throw rug involved? He went upstairs. Right. He found that the throw rug was in the wrong place. He either kicked it up or picked it up, and as he put it, found five bullet holes in the floor. He went to the officers that were responding and doing the investigation, He told them about it, and they told him if he didn't want to end up in jail, he better get the hell out of there. Hmm. Do we know how many how many bullets came out of that with the gun? Well, it was a thirty caliber Luger knockoff, so I would imagine it was uh, one in the chamber and maybe eight or nine in the clip. Wow! Like because there was more there was more holes in that that house. What about the Russian roulette talk? How can you play Russian roulette with a clip? Yeah, you can't. <laughs> it was great difficulty. Have you ever seen the Deer Hunter? Have you ever seen the Deer Hunter? Come on. Um, yeah. Um, well, spin the clip. Right, right. Um, so, getting back to the crime scene, like I said, there was there was like bullet holes in that, like Swiss cheese in that house. Okay. This is what Betty Shane, Robert Shane's widow, told me when I did the first speeding bullet, the magazine edition. Her dentist's father was a contractor and was hired by Tony Mannix to renovate George's house to put up for sale. He told Betty and Bob Shane that that house was full of bullet holes. Hmm. It was full of bullet holes. That means there's been all... You see, you also have to understand, all of a sudden, George gets with this new gal, Lenore Lemon. And there's all this gunplay. George was a gun collector. He had respect for firearms. He knew gunplay was not a responsible option. Okay? But why weren't these kinds of events, if he was as wild and suicidal and, and, and putting blanks in his gun and popping them up against his head? And by the way, you can ask Brandon Lee and John Hexham about that one because it don't work. A squib can take you out just as easy as a live shell. Yeah, yeah they died okay? on the set, yeah. But, it, you know, how do you get around that one? Hmm. You yeah. see? It, if he was that despondent, why wasn't he doing this when he was with Tony Mannix? Right. <clears throat> This, this would be a long-term pattern, not just something that it develops in an evening. 
Very, very interesting, folks. Very interesting. We're talking about the case, the, the, the mysterious suicide slash murder of actor George Reeves. Everybody knows him from being the original Superman. Um, so, the, so George Reeves' mother hires famed attorney Jerry Giesler, famous for the you know uh, Lana, Tur- Lynn, Lana, Lana Turner. Yeah. So, so talk about what he because he he quit abruptly. Well, I think he quit abruptly because he realized that this was a maze of questions as opposed to a maze that could be untangled with answers. I think he just came to the realization this was open and shut and somebody did something somewhere. Hmm. See, you have to ask yourself a very simple question. If all of these officers were there and supposedly two responded and then Sergeant V.A. Peterson came and supposedly took four to six pictures. That's wrong right there. When you canvas a scene like that, you take hundreds of pictures. And you also separate every single one of the witnesses out of earshot with each other and question them individually so they can't hear what the others are saying. And why weren't they taken down to the station house and why wasn't that done? Now, we don't know whether they were or they weren't. There's no information on that. But they were let go. Why was Lenore Lemon able to travel back to New York (laughs) shortly after, in less than a week? That's not procedure. That's irregular. That's an anomaly. Right. So investigators and, and police as well they would the story goes they would have you believe that you know they came home night one that night they had an argument she went downstairs to drink have a good time he basically went upstairs and blew his brains out well the, the, it was basically they came home and bill bliss a neighbor showed up at the door knocked on the door uh and basically said hey could i come in you know the now, light was on right. party at one time o- at one o- what, what roughly what one o'clock in the morning maybe this whole thing well, with the, the, probably the, somewhere i would i would guesstimate somewhere between 12 and one and george came down the stairs and said i'm trying to get some sleep will you get the hell out of here yelled at bill had a change of heart sat down and had a drink with him and then went upstairs and blew his brains out <laughs> Yeah, that, that doesn't jive. I, I don't know. It, no, it, none of it jives. None, none of it, it makes. It's like Judge Judy says: if it doesn't make sense, it didn't happen. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, you know, who knows? I mean, I I tend to side with the fact that they got their story straight because Lenore was upstairs and had a beef with him, and you know, she pulled the trigger. But what about all the other bullet holes? Right, right. That's what I'm saying. There's so many. I mean, you, you see, every time there's so many you holes in that some house. sort of a conclusion, you get thrown back into this other, the, 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 the quagmire of questions. I mean, there's so many holes in that house. You can make it could be like a wind tunnel for test vehicles. Well, it's Swiss <laughs> cheese. It's Swiss cheese. Uh, Up and down, did upstairs any... and downstairs, from what the contractor said to Betty Shane. Uh, did, did anybody, any of the neighbors hear the gunshots? I talked to Hal Smith, who played Otis. Oh, yes. On the Andy Griffith yeah, show. Yeah, he was also, in many, many, yeah, many he was movies. Yeah, uh, he was in there with Don Knotts there, my, my ghost of Mr. Chicken. Yes, of course. <laughs> he told me his agent lived right next door to George. And he was there the night of the event. He told me, the agent told him, he only heard one shot. Hmm. More questions. Wow. Now, there was another person there that a lot of people don't know about. She was interviewed 18 years ago on a program called 2020 Downtown by Bill Ritter, who was the host and, and the yes. lead reporter on this. I don't, know, I, I, I don't know whether he was the host. I know he was the lead reporter. Now, she was in her 90s and a bit confused. She said she had gone down to George's house to get her husband, Bill, who is, of course, as you know from your reading, is mentioned in all the reports, out of the house. She said that she got right to the front door, and you could see in through the window, and in the, in the, well, it was probably the window that showed the stairway, not the, the whole living room. And she said that she saw George come downstairs, have the argument with Bill Bliss, and then go back upstairs. But what was really interesting about this is she said she was contemplating going around the back so nobody would know why she was there. Hmm. 
Well, you got to ask yourself one big question about this another flurry of questions. Why would she be going down to George Reeves' house to get her husband out of there if they were all great friends and it was just a social occasion? You know, if my wife finds out I'm somewhere and comes and gets me, she generally thinks I'm doing something I shouldn't be yeah, doing. Right. These guys are like mafia assassins getting ready to kill the kill the you know kill somebody. Yeah, well, the, but the, the whole thing about the gangster angle, this thing is so amateurish, and, and no self-respecting gangster would have had anything to do with this. What hitman whacks out a person with four other people in the house? I mean, look how they did Bugsy Siegel. I mean, it took like three or four in the head. I mean, that was precise. <laughs> yeah, but three or four in the head while he was alone watching test right. footage. Through the window. That he had done at, at one of the studios trying to become an actor. Right, right, right. What, yeah. what hitman does that? <laughs> I have no idea. And then idea. there's a book that purports that one of the people who arranged this went and visited the hitman and his son in Montana to make sure the hitman was all right. You never see these guys. They're ghosts. These guys are ghosts, right. It's it team. doesn't work that way. Wow. Those okay. people don't expose themselves to the people that paid them. You never know who the guy is. Yeah. Or if you do, you won't for long. Yeah, right. <laughs> so many interesting so, I mean, things. You know, where do you, see, where do you go with this? Uh, okay. Why did Jan Bliss feel that she had to go and pull her husband out of George Reeves' house unless she had some suspicion about God knows what going on there. Hmm. See, how does that work? Hmm. Well, it doesn't. I want to get back, if we can, Jane, I want to get back to the mur oh, the crime scene. Okay, uh, let's talk about the shell casing, where, where it was found and how it would get there. Well, one of the only reported shell casing there probably were many, but where they were, I have no idea. It was under George's back. He was lying on it. Lying on the bed. Backwards. Backwards. On, on his back, on the bed, with the shell casing under him. Uh, no a, burn. No on burn. The back. No burn on no his burn. back. How does it get there? Big problem. Yeah, big, big question. Big problem. So, I mean, it, it, people who, who have said this to me, I said, so what did he do? Decide he wasn't going to mess up the bed and sat up until the shale casing cooled off? That's nonsense. Was it, w correct me if I'm wrong. Was there also a bullet in the ceiling? The bullet that went through his head, it was not in, exactly in the ceiling, but it was in the upper parts of the wall, which they pulled out and found uh, brain matter and blood on, hmm. according to them. See, this is all according to people we can't get a hold of. And I'll tell you something else. If we could get a hold of them, they wouldn't tell you the truth then or now. Mm. It's a code of silence. Right. Wow. Something went on. Yeah, something, something happened. So that, the, the, the weapon itself was a, a Luger, and it was found... Well, it was well, a thirty caliber Luger, not a 9 millimeter. Okay. If it would have been a 9 millimeter, the exit wound would have been as big as a dinner plate. <laughs> uh, where was the gun found? Supposedly between George's feet. Kind of like Vince Foster. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, how, how does it even get there if you blow your brains out? <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. This Wouldn't is... you think the body would fall forward? Gravity? Mm. Why would it go backward? And what if the body did fall forward and certain parties moved the body before showering? And the thing of it is, then the gunpowder residue test was very primitive. But I've been told that showering doesn't always remove all the gunpowder residue. Right. Uh, I, I've heard you can use Ajax. Oops. That's what well, I heard a story. I heard a story about the reason that Bob uh, Blake, Robert Blake, Robert Blake, didn't have any gunpowder residue on him was because of the fact that he was sitting on the lawn wiping his hands. Well, the antique weapon that was used in the murder of Bonnie Lee Bakley it was known to spew an awful lot of gunpowder. And that's not an exact science. It doesn't go the same way every time. 
it depends on a lot of factors. Yeah, so many interesting theories. Folks, joining me on the phone is Jan Henderson. He was, I know he doesn't like to hear this, but he is a, pretty much the expert on the, the, the case of the death of George Reeves. There's a great website as well at janallenhenderson.com. That's A L A N, janallenhenderson.com. His books are phen- phenomenal. Uh, check them out on Amazon. Um, he is this. Actually, Speeding Bullet and Behind the Crimson Cape, sorry to interrupt, are available on oldies.com exclusive. Okay. The rest are available on Amazon. Okay, okay. And, and your website, janallenhenderson.com, is yeah. so much but information. Th- th- that also has a lot more than Superman on yeah, it. Yeah, it's got amazing stuff on there, amazing books as well. And uh, did when you did your investigation, did you, ever, after the, obviously, um, did, did you speak with Phyllis Coates and Jack Larson? Of course. And what was their theory? Jim, Jim, Phyllis Coates didn't know. Phyllis she Coates, was, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Phyllis Coates, for people out there that do, do not know, was Lois Lane, the original Lois Lane, and Jack Larson, Jimmy Olsen, and Superman. Go ahead. Phyllis Coates didn't know, but to be perfectly honest with you, all of George's friends, when they heard he had taken up with Lenore Lemon, shied away because they all knew her reputation from the past. And Noel Neal also told me something I found very interesting that when she was a kid, she would go and visit her father's newspaper office, because he was a newspaper man, and read the teletype reports about Lenore's antics at places like uh, the Stork Club, where she got kicked out for fighting with another patron. Hmm. Stork Club, famous for uh, Walter Winchell. Well, Walter Winchell was somebody she mentioned continuously. Really? Yeah. Hmm. In, in what way? As being the guy that George should have relied on to cover up this mess, only unfortunately George was dead. Wow. Amazing. She said that in one of her last, I think it was actually, she did two interviews at the end of her life. One was for Extra and the other was for her current affair. And one, she got very angry and blew up at the interviewer and said, well... The subject, George is dead, and the subject is just as dead. Is the house still there? Yeah, sure. Yep. And where and there is... are people living in it. Do they know what happened inside that house? Yes. I'm even told they have copies of Speeding Bullet. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Well, you see, there's been a lot of stories, and another one is from the paranormal. And this comes from... Dorothy Kilgallen's com- column, and this is uh, uh, probably, I would say, mid-1960. I can't remember right off the top of my head. But Lenore had a girlfriend, Gwen Daly, who was married to the actor Dan Daly, um, and they were supposedly over in England entertaining the lords and ladies with the whole suicide story, as well as the fact that George's ghost still haunts the house and that has gotten more ink over the years than it ever should have because that's just rumors that's nonsense Mm. Mm. Um, I want to ask you because after after the death of George Reeves what happened to Tony Mannix and what was her reaction obviously she was you know well she became a recluse okay pretty much although she wasn't completely out of the, the, the picture, but, you know, obviously she was shattered. She did not go to the funeral. She didn't go to the funeral. Lenore Lemon didn't go to the funeral. Wow. Now, if someone is grieving a lost mate and you don't go to the funeral, what does that say? That says you're afraid you might get arrested if you show up. Well, yeah, but (laughs) why was she already in New York by the time that funeral occurred? And I'm sure there's lots of people that are going to tell you a lot of different stories and that I don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Because to be honest with you, there are no experts in this thing. This is like trying to wrestle with a uh, six-headed rattlesnake that's been dipped in Crisco. Mm. You can't get your hooks in it. Yeah, no, it's uh, very, it's like an eel, very slippery. And, uh, it is. It's very, very difficult. It very much is. Uh, uh, talk about your relationship with Fred Crane. Well, this is very interesting. I was at a screening 
And some friends put out another Superman-related book by another author. And he had promised them the George Reeves story, but wanted to do another book on two spinoff shows called Superboy and Super Pup, which he did do. And they were complaining that these books hadn't sold very well, and they had wished that he had come forward with his promise to do the George Reeves story. And I happened to be standing there. We were just talking in a group. It, it was a screaming. It was between films. And I just said, without even thinking, oh, I'll give you a manuscript in six months. <laughs> so I was talking to a friend of mine by the name of John Norris, who lives in New Orleans. Not New Orleans. He lives in uh, Memphis now, I believe. No, Nashville. Sorry about that. Get confused. Oh, it's okay. But the bottom line is, is I, I said to him, I, mean, I said, I mean, it's, hard, know, not, it's hard not to get confused. <laughs> well, yeah, the confusion is the epitaph, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. But anyway, uh, I was talking to John, and I said, you know, I pitched this thing, and I've gone through my stuff, and I don't think I've got enough juice here to pull a book off. And he said, would you, would you like to talk to Fred Crane? I said, yeah, well, where is he? He said, he's four miles from your house. You want his phone number? I got his phone number. We talked on the phone. A couple days later, I was sitting in his living room talking to him. And we did the interview that appears in speeding, all the speeding bullets, all three versions. Wow. So, and Fred and I stayed in touch. I stayed in touch with his family um, up to the time he passed. And I have minimal contact with them, uh, you know, here and there after he passed. And he was a great friend, and as he said, he, like George's mother, never believed that George committed suicide. Mm. And he was very firm in that, and willing, ready, and able to stand up for George at any opportunity. Did you did you interview Gene LaBelle, friend of George? Yes, I did. What was his? Theory? Oh yeah, there was another instance where fate took this project into its hands and guided it. Uh, Gene's co-author of The Godfather of Grappling, Bob Calhoun, uh, wrote a story on Hollywoodland, and he had some questions for me. It was published in a magazine I've been with as a contributor for 32 years called Film Facts, and he called me up after he had finished the piece and was asking me some questions. And I said to him, could you do me a favor the next time you talk to Gene? He said, sure. I said, ask him about the shell under him and why Gene thinks that it was not notated in the autopsy report. Fine, we hang up. Sometime later, the phone rings. It's Gene LaBelle. I said, did Bob ask you the question? He said, yeah. And Jan, you know the answer to that. Now, the interview is at 9 p.m. I'll talk to you then. And we did the interview that night. That's how that happened. That fell into my lap. Wow. That was one of the easiest ones I ever pulled. <laughs> you also wrote a book called Crip 39, Corwin's Case 45426, George Reeves. What made you want to re write that book? Because everybody was asking me what I thought All right. happened. And with no conclusion, I decided to recreate through George's voice his life in the last 10 years of his life. Hmm. And it's a novel. It's fiction. I have had to change some things to make the story flow, but it's all narrated by George straight from his, his crypt at the morgue when he was delivered there, crypt 39. Hmm. It was actually, it was actually the crypt he was kept in at the funeral home, but you know, everybody changes everything in Hollywood these days, don't hmm. they? Yeah. Right. Um, uh, I want to ask you one couple of questions because we're running out of time, and I know you got to get going. Um, there was also bruises to it on his head and body that that were never fully investigated. There was, there was. Well, Gene LaBelle had the answer to that. What did he say? He worked out with him that day. Whoa, was he wrestling? Yeah, oh. they were doing their workouts that day. Hmm. He saw George the day of his passing. Hmm. And and he said, I gave George those bruises, and he was damn proud of them. <laughs> Did they interview the other the other guests in in the house that night? They took their information, but as far as an in depth interview, right, right. not to my knowledge, there's no paper evidence of it. There are there are witness statements, 
hmm. as to who was there and, and what happened. So, so my audience knows, this case is classified as a suicide. It should be classified undetermined. Right. That's, that's, if, if it ever got changed, and it never will, that would probably be your best outcome. Yeah. It probably not like you said. A lot of people are dead, although they don't want to talk. I mean, obviously, the, we all know the Natalie Wood case got changed, um, but there's some people still living. Yeah, but but the, the only person that's talking is the captain. Right. Um, that was the name, Dennis Dennis Deverne. Yeah, exactly. Right. He's the only one that's talking. Hmm. And what was that? It sounds like drunken misadventure to me, which is what I think this is. Right. Right. So it, because it's too sloppy. It is too sloppy. There, there's reports that somebody came through the window. She, Lenore, let, Lenore let somebody yeah, in. That, yeah, boy, that one is as yeah. old as Santa Claus's uh, <laughs> uh, knee boots. Yeah, there, there's just so many. I mean, he drove with, like I said, we, I mentioned a lot, two or three times, the 2.7 alcohol. That's, that's like, you know, you're passed out. Um, the the 2.7 is on the verge of alcohol poisoning. Right. Nobody nobody drives it. They, they, now, there are seasoned drinkers that can do that. I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility. I'm saying use common sense and, and figure this out. You see, the point of the speeding bullets was to get people to think for themselves. All I did was prevent, uh, pre prevent present the information that I had and ask questions. It's not a book where people are lectured on what I think. Because to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think anything. You know, this, this investigation is ongoing. For me, this has been 51 years. I started this when I was 17 years old in wow. October of 1967. Wow. And no, I was not obsessed. I didn't do it every day. But things would come my way, and I would investigate. I have no background in law enforcement. I'll tell you who I learned a lot from was your guest, Steve Hodell. Oh, Steve. Reading his books. Amazing. The guy to... is phenomenal. He's phenomenal. Phenomenal. You know, and, he, and he's got a new one coming out very shortly, Black Dahlia Avenger 3, with more startling evidence. Mm. Don't know what it is because it isn't out yet. And, and just to sum this up, if I can, Jen, um, like I said, you got to remember this is... 1959 okay superman was at the height he was at the height of his career in terms of you know celebrity and like i said the little kids who were eight nine ten years old they looked up to him he knew he had a, his fan base was you know young kids looked up to him they idolized him yeah. that was a hero for him to commit suicide and have those break the, those kids hearts doesn't make any sense he, he wouldn't have done that right just doesn't there's make no any two sense. ways about it george loved kids because he couldn't have kids well that's the reason his first marriage allegedly broke up. Right. So there'd be no way, and I mean, from, you, you obviously know a lot more than I do, but... This... Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is this doesn't add up. Why, exactly as you just said. Why would he break all those children's hearts? Right, right. Unless he was absolutely so despondent, as some have claimed, that he just went and did this. But he had, you know, the seventh season. Right. He had right. a tour of Australia... Supposedly lined up. There's no paper proof of that. There was work. Okay. Yeah. So why would he do that? Yeah, right. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make and any sense. And first of all, what Gene LaBelle told me about George Reeves, he could sit in a crowded room in a party and block everybody off and learn a script without being bothered by all the distractions. I think what he did is block Lenore out, and she got upset to the point of taking it two steps too far. So in your, in your investigation, like you said, I mean, so pretty much you think that he went, up, he went upstairs and she came with him, and there was an argument, and, and, mm -hmm. and she, she killed him because they were drinking and, you know, stuff happens. Yeah. That's what I think. Okay. And that happens in, in communities. Right. All across this country and all throughout the world, you can read about it every day right. where, where a situation like this occurs. Oh. I mean, domestic violence is one of our biggest problems in this country. Mm. Mm. Amazing. 
So many theories, so many stories out there, Jana. I want to thank you for coming on because I, 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 this has been great for me because um, I've always been f- fascinated by like a lot of people out there to, to, about this case. And um, f- to learn more, please visit com. That's A-L-A-N-1-L, com. Check out his books. Just Google Jan Henderson as well. And, um, you know, like they say, a mystery that can never be solved is truly a mystery. And that's what this, the death of George Reeves is. You know? uh, so, Jan, I want to thank you again for coming on. And like I said, please visit janallenhenderson.com and Google Jan Allen Henderson. There's so much information out there about him. And um, thank you so much for doing this, Jan. I really appreciate it. And um, we will definitely talk to you down the road. All right, Mike. Thanks again. And hello to Boston. All right, ma'am. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, bye. All right, folks. That's our show. As always, thank you so much for tuning in every Saturday at, from 2 to 3 o'clock right here on AM 1550 WNTN. And um, my thanks to Jan Henderson for joining me this afternoon. So many, so many interesting theories out there as to what happened to the death of Superman, George Reeves. Um, it, this is a case that will never be solved, and there's so many questions, like he said. Every time you answer a question, five more come come right behind it. So it is a fascinating case, and um, uh, stay tuned. Um, that was... This show was one a uh, part of our Hollywood murder mystery shows, folks. Please go to SoundCloud, search WNTN. Um, I've been doing these murder mystery shows, and they've getting a lot, a lot of tons of feedback. I also did the uh, Natalie Wood did the murder of uh, well, the death of Natalie Wood. Now we did George Reeves. Uh, I also did the um, death of Ronnie Chasen. She was a powerful, very powerful Hollywood publicist in Hollywood. Um, Fascinating case. We're driving home from a premiere one night, and um, somebody pumped four or five bullets into her, and uh, nobody knows who did it. Well, somebody did it, but he's not talking right now because he, he's unable to. Um, and we also did The Black Dahlia, Steve Hodell. That's probably our highest stream show, a uh, highest stream show ever. Um, it's on The Black Dahlia, Steve Hodell, legendary L.A. Po- police detective. Um, it's a fascinating story, folks. Please visit SoundCloud. Search WNTN to hear all these parts of my Hollywood murder mystery shows, folks. Nobody's doing these types of shows in the radios. I, I, I preach this every week. Um, my show is very unique. It's called Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. More and more publicists email me every day, every week, asking me for more of these shows so they can feed them to their clients um, to hear these fascinating interviews. And um got some great guests lined up down the road. And um, big thank you to everybody who's giving me feedback, the comments, the shares, the likes. Um, that's it. Keep them rolling. Get this show out there. Get the ball rolling because this show is big in L.A. It's making its way out to L.A. Uh, tons of contacts. Um, I want to thank everybody. And I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving out there. And I um, hope everybody joined their, their, their family, um, their alcohol. I hope there wasn't too many people on the road driving with a 2.7 like George Reeves did that night. Because uh, you, uh, you'll be at Mass General getting your stomach pumped. Uh, so all you jive turkeys out there, I hope you guys had a great time as well. And um, that's it. So thank you so much. And we will see you again next Saturday at 2 o'clock right here on AM 1550 WNTN. Please visit, before I forget, please visit SoundCloud. All my shows are up on SoundCloud. They're up on iTunes, dudes. They are up on iTunes. Just search Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. Um, All my shows come up there. Some fascinating interviews up there. And um, that's it. We will see you next Saturday from 2 to 3 with another great guest. Bam! If you like this interview, please click the subscribe button and click the notification bell to be notified whenever we upload a new episode.